You're welcome back. You're so live here on Ghana tonight. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, the SCV channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. She was one time the women's organizer of the ruling New Patriotic Party, former Minister for Gender, Children and Social Protection. She's committed to a number of things, including the issues of not just women and children, but the disabled in society. Madam Otiko Afisa Jabba is with us in the studio. Thank you so much for making the time to join us. It's hmm. a privilege to be here. Thank it's, you. it's been a while. <laughs> I know, where, right? Where have you been? <laughs> I've retired from politics. You've retired from politics. Yes. What does that mean? I mean, it some people say that... once a politician, always a politician. Mm, they say never say never. However, I'm preoccupied now with issues of disability and uh, vulnerable women. And I have set up a foundation called the Henry Jabba Memorial Foundation in memory of my mm, late, your late father. father. Yes, and so that is what occupies me now. I see. Is, is that the reason why you, you, you rejected the ambassadorial position offered to you by the, by the president in 2018 to be ambassador to Italy because you've retired from politics? <laughs> No, it was um, long overdue. I've been working in this area of serving Ghana in development, rural development, and then the political scene since uh, 1998. Mm. So um, I needed to spend time with my family. I have four children. Right. And so it was very important that um, I focus on them as well. In my, that is what happens to women mm. when you are pursuing your own career and other ambitions. Something will lose out, and I found that was my family, and right. so it was important to spend time with them. And I was getting close to 60 at the time, mm. so it was a good time to um, come out of politics. And also, I had lived in England for about 16 years, and I was not interested in living outside Ghana again. I see. So those so, were my reasons. So the, your, your, your political responsibilities was depriving you of the family time. It was having, yes, it was yes. having a negative impact yes, on your family, yes. I was, the politics. I, wasn't, I was absent. I wasn't there. I was traveling all over the country and other places to mm. get our message out, to mobilize the women and young people for my party. And that mm. is really consuming in terms of time, in terms of everything. I see. Do you, you have any moments of, of regret serving the MPP? Oh my goodness. <laughs> it was a privilege. Mm. How many people get to be a women's organizer? Right. And I was a women's organizer twice. Indeed. How many people get, how many women's organizers have become ministers of state? And look, when I came to this business of women's organizer, the election of 2010, mm -hmm. I was the only woman out of the 10 elected officers. It tells you how the people felt about me. To vote for me, I didn't know much about politics at the time. Mm. And then the second, my second term, yeah. that's uh, 2014 14. in Tamale. I was the sole survivor well, of all well, my other incumbent. the 10 who had uh, contested in the 2010. Ten. I was the only one who was elected, all the others lost. That mm. is a huge responsibility. And uh, I'm really very grateful to mm. my party members for that honor. For me, it's a privilege that they did to me. And mm. I will always appreciate that of them. Indeed. To have that sense of, um, give me that sense of responsibility. It's a huge responsibility to True. be the sole survivor. To be the only woman amongst 10 elected officers. Mm -hmm. And so I have no regrets at all. I, and I learned so much. I met all sorts of people that I would never have met. It was mm -hmm. a huge learning curve. Now, do you think that's what is also impacting on the, the decreasing number of women mm -hmm. um, in politics? And that's one side of the conversation. And also, even when the political parties make the effort to try and encourage women to get there by reducing filing fees and other things, you still don't have a lot of women um, getting into political positions. I mean, they just ended NDC primaries, just a few women 
were able to, to get through and, and be elected. So what's, what's really the challenge? Well, before I go there, I want to congratulate all the women who won. Mm. And I want to congratulate all Ghanaian women. Women have come far. It's not as bleak as it looks like. Once upon a time, there were no women in parliament at all. And True. women didn't work. But now we have 40 women. That's the highest in the history of this country. We have over 240 something in the assemblies. Mm -hmm. And so it is a step forward, but the gap is so huge that you need a whole hour for us to talk about that issue. Mm -hmm. But to summarize, we have a parochial system in Ghana where there is a predominance of the males in leadership. Mm -hmm. And so the cultural and traditional aspects of how we are brought up mm -hmm. makes it difficult for women to be seen in leadership, which is unfortunate because women are born leaders. It's the woman, the mother, who coaches and mentors the children, like you, to be who you are. Indeed. Yes, even uh, Nelson Mandela had a mother. Pele had a mother, you know, Bill Gates has a mother. Mm. Everybody in this world was born by some woman. And that woman would have brought that child and nurtured that, that is leadership. Oh. So somehow, as the world has progressed, and then uh, women were supposed to stay at home, whilst men went to war, go to work, and all of that. Fast forward, it is changing, mm -hmm. and uh, women are, some women are breadwinners. True. So... Those things have been holding us back. And I say the time has come to drop them. In this world, anything that doesn't help you to accelerate your development is not worth carrying along. So those negative traditions and thinking that the woman is only good for the kitchen to be a hairdresser and a supporting actor, no, it won't buy, it will not wash now. But I want us to get back into some of the things that you're very passionate about. Mm -hmm. Some of the policies that you champion while, mm -hmm. while even as minister for gender children and social protection the school feeding program mm. school feeding yes. i mean we're talking at a time when the caterers under this school feeding program mm. have not been paid for one whole year these are th three terms they went in the ashanti region for instance went to the minister's office the minister snapped them i mean you saw that video yeah. looking at it and and what you're going through how did that get to you very unfortunate. Over 80% of those women were employed by me. You were employed by you? Yes. I'm the first uh, gender minister under the... School feeding program. First minister for gender, mm. children and social, social protection. protection. School feeding is just a small part of, of it. it. Uh -huh. And so I had that privilege to appoint them. And so it was to help them to get jobs, help them to create wealth to be able to earn an income. A lot of them are single parents and their widows and what have you. And so when they are not being paid, that means that that purpose is defeated. And then they are supposed to cook a hot, nutritious meal. Mm -hmm. And the amount of 97 pesos is ridiculous. 97 pesos? Yes, it's ridiculous. During my time, when I came, it was 80 pesos. And mm -hmm. we went to cabinet and then for parliamentary approval and we took it to one city. Then mm. they deducted 30 pesos as mm. tax. So it's now 97 uh, pesos. But how did you come to that kind of computation? You have, I mean, 97 pesos per child. Um, how, what, what food can you cook with 97 pesos, yes, really? We asked for two CDs. And the government, through the negotiations, then brought it down to the one CD. And then, like I said, the tax then came in, which took out uh, 30 pesos. Mm. So it was something that was supposed to be done and then we would review it and move it up i see exactly but yeah. even with the one thing you tax it and took 30 percent from 30 the tax tax from it couldn't it, it was, have been tax exempt it could have been but i don't know why that came it came after i had left the I negotiation see. was for one city at the time uh -huh. and so it is unfortunate because Nobody can cook with 97 pesos. And then when you owe, it means that the person or the bank or whichever institution you've borrowed the money from will no longer give you money until you pay. Mm -hmm. That means that you are overwhelmed with indebtedness. And you Absolutely. cannot continue to cook the food. Mm -hmm. And so it is a triple jeopardy. 
and um, I have said it once, I've said it twice, and I'm saying it again on your platform. Government should stop pretending to pay the caterers. You should stop pretending to pay yes, the caterers. and the caterers too would then stop pretending to cook a hot, nutritious meal. Because you cannot cook a hot, nutritious meal with 97 pesos. That's what I mean. Hmm. And so they must ensure that the, all the arrears is paid immediately. It must mm. be paid. In, no woman can wait. And you see, it's about uh, poverty alleviation, whereby the whole program of school feeding was to be sent to the very deprived poor areas. And then for those children to be able to go to school and they go to eat, and That's then they right. remain and become citizens and uh, mm. people like you, mm -hmm. journalists and what have you. And so when the food, especially in those areas, is not being given, that means that another purpose of it, there will not be attendance. It will reduce. True. And then staying in school too will reduce. And then mm. parents who cannot afford to give their children food will then say, then go to the farm. And mm. so that means that all of that that we wanted for education, and we keep talking about future leaders and what have you, if you don't invest in your children, there will be no future. And that is paramount, to have that legacy whereby we reduce and eradicate intergenerational poverty and mm -hmm. have a legacy whereby a Ghanaian child feels good about being a Ghanaian. In fact, there's evidence that the school feeding program actually improved enrollment levels in oh. the hard-to-reach mm -hmm. communities. Mm -hmm. that, that is documented. Class sizes exploded. I was mm -hmm. working in Tumu at the time when uh, President Kufu initiated it. And these are very deprived, I was working in 98 deprived communities. Class sizes exploded. Because of school feeding. Yes. People knew they would come to exactly. school and get something to eat. Very important. You know, when you are hungry, you no, know, you can't learn. And so when there is food, then you, they say the way to a man's <laughs> heart is through the stomach. It's, yes, the same depends way with on children. the kind of food you eat. By and the, the food right, must be good quality. In, indeed. Uh -huh. It must be good quality. So the issue of school feeding is something that really worries me, and I've been mm. speaking about it. And uh, I'm being told that Ministry of Finance has released some of the monies and that it takes some processes for it to then finally hit the accounts of the women. We are praying then and calling upon them to hasten those processes so that the monies will be paid, that is the arrears, and then to do a serious negotiation and up the amount. They're asking for three they CDs asking now. asking for three CDs now. With mm -hmm. inflation and what have you, I'm even saying they should take it to five CDs. And they should to find five the CDs. money wherever they have to find it. They should find it. Because food prices have gone up astronomically. Yes. And then with all this that, that we are saying, you want yes. five CDs. Yes, yes, yes. Because uh, how much is both fruit? Both fruit now is, depends uh -huh. on where you are buying it. Uh -huh. Ten CDs, five uh -huh. CDs sometimes. Uh -huh. Pure water. Just a such it. Fifty pesos. You understand? Before, they will buy gas, uh, firewood, uh, pay the people who cut the onions and serve the food, um, get all the utensils. There's a lot going into it. Mm -hmm. Just cooking for one child, let alone 300, 400, 500. And so this issue of school feeding is not something that we can be sluggish about. Mm. We cannot procrastinate on the things that matter. And this is a serious issue of the development of the future of Ghana because this is about our children. Mm. And when you talk about it, government talks about the state of the economy, so they cannot afford some of these things. And in fact, even under the IMF program, mm -hmm. some of these social interventions is up for a review, mm -hmm. cutting down some of it, including the school feeding program. Mm. That, that, that certainly should be of concern to you. Ghana should find the money. There is nothing more important than children. It's like a hen. When the hen eats its eggs, where will other and uh, fowls come from. And so for as long as our children are not in school, you cannot cut down the cost of feeding them because it is part of the cost of educating them. Mm. Prisoners, their food by government is one CD 80 pesos. At the senior high school level, it's five CDs 20 pesos. So why should the children at basic not also be given an appreciable amount? if we value them. In this world, whatever is important to you, you make sure that you get it done. Political will must be put on it, and they must find the money. We don't have a choice. 
What's the point of having free education if children are not going to school? They must go to the basic before they can get to the senior high school. We want a Ghana where every child of school going aid is in school. It is in the Children's Act. That is our bona fide right as Ghanaians. And nobody should joke about education because it is the key to the development of everybody. And it's the key out of poverty. If we are talking about a Ghana without aid, it is because of how we invest today and make sure that our children get well educated. And when they are well educated, they will be in a better position to manage our affairs as our ancestors designed it. This is Ghana we are talking about. We are capable of being the first African state in sub-Saharan Africa to have achieved independence. Only 6 million Ghanaians, and today we are 30 million. What are you talking about? School feeding. Please, let's get serious in this country. Hmm. One of our concerns is, is how we're seeing children drowning as a result of the, the usage of these um, canoes and without life jackets, <laughs> At, all in these island communities as well. Since January, we've, we've lost as many as 23 of these pupils as a result of these boat accidents. I would like to extend my sympathies from my heart because I have four children too, uh -huh. to the families who have lost their children recently. This tragic nine children, before that... Uh, there were eight of them in yes. January, we lost uh -huh. nine. Yeah. And it As goes well. on. It goes on. I'm really, really sorry, and I extend my condolences to the families. The solution is what we are now looking at when mm -hmm. you have these problems, because it's not only the canoe. There are children who go to school and get hit by cars, Indeed. or the car gets involved in an accident. Mm -hmm. There are children who are killed through ritual murders. Uh, even young girls, some a girl, Mankesim. Yeah. She went for an interview, and then her in-law, and her, who is supposed to be a pastor, can you imagine? And the chief end up killing her. Too many issues. That's why I say we are eating our eggs concerning mm. our future. And so, education being a priority, where they need to cross a river to get to school, the best solution is to have a school in the community. So they don't cross the river? Yes, so that they don't cross the river. That is what should be done. The community and government can start putting together something and the assemblies until they can have a good structure and then bring in the teachers. Because I worked in very rural areas, mm -hmm. I know about this. Sometimes they use a mosque or a church to even teach the children and then the teachers, they get accommodation for them in the community. If anybody is to use a canoe, there must be a life jacket. And you don't hire it. This should be free. It should not be sold to anybody. And I understand that some of the children were between 8 and 17. Yes. And that's unacceptable. Nobody under the age of 18 should be manning a canoe. Nobody under the age of 18 should be left under their own supervision. Those are the laws. Because they are still children. Mm -hmm. In Ghana, the Children's Act says that from zero to 18, you are still a child. Mm -hmm. You see six-year-olds walking to school on their own. Then somebody kidnaps them or a car hits them. That is irresponsibility on the part of the parents. Hmm. For the canoe is the irresponsibility of the owner of the canoe and for the parents who don't have a choice. And so if you want your child educated, they must sit in a canoe. But from today, they shouldn't sit in a canoe. I'm sure there is a church or a mosque in, that commu community. in those communities. GES should get teachers there, and the communities should help them with accommodation, and then they will sit there and teach them so that they don't have to ever. No child in Ghana should ever die by crossing any river to go to school. Hmm. Then what is the point? Indeed. You want the child educated and the child dies in the pursuit of just getting to the school? What, what are we talking about? Look, <laughs> this is 2023, and Ghana is 66 years old. We must do things differently. If you want a developed country, you cannot keep repeating the same things and doing the same things. And you must hasten the pace of development. And you must carry the people along. And unless they are well educated, it will be very difficult to achieve those um, programs the, 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 that you want to achieve. Yes, or the milestones for your country. 
Hmm. And the world is looking at Ghana, and we have to be serious about especially the development of our children. So this must never happen again. Hmm. I don't want next year's like the rains. We talk about the uh, floods, floods and, then. and then it's the same every year. No, 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 no. Because a child lost, that's a life gone. To not come back again. Indeed. Never again. You know, so we have to solve this problem mm -hmm. this year. And GES must set up and get it right. Hmm. While we round up uh, then very quickly, there have been questions and concerns about the, the uh, uh, Gender and Children Protection Ministry as well and the lack of proactivity. And because you've been there before, just want to find out why why this is the case. I mean, up until now, we haven't heard from the Gender Minister on some of these issues. Last year, in fact, almost two years ago, about 13 children were sodomized somewhere in the Savannah region. Mm -hmm. It took almost seven weeks for the Gender Ministry to even issue a statement on it. Mm -hmm. You've been there before. What is the situation in, in, in that ministry? I don't think you're being fair to me. I will not be the best person to say anything <laughs> on this issue. And the one to answer these questions will be the current gender mm. minister. All I will say is that when one is given an opportunity, a privilege to serve, you must solve the problems. You must attend to them. Mm. And so the Ministry of Gender must get up and get those things done you mm. might not be given that opportunity ever okay. again. And now that you are in that position, you must move heaven and earth to get the things that you need. The mandate that you were given, mm. you must get it done. That is what I would like to say on that. Great. Beyond that, I think that the current minister is the best person to answer those things. The other thing that I wanted to talk about is the number of women in uh, parliament. Right. That the numbers being so small, the time has come for us all, apart from the affirmative action and the quotas, for women themselves to be more proactive, right. to be confident, to believe in yourself, and to understand that you have a very key and important role to play in this world and in Ghana. And so if you educate yourself, you put yourself in a better position. If you ensure that you are strategically placed, if you want to become an MP, you don't sit back. You have to go to the community and let them know you and be part of their activities. You have to shut your ears to your detractors mm -hmm. and just focus on what you want to do. You must have quality time and be able to juggle because you are a mother, you are a worker, you are a wife or a partner or what have you. You must learn to do all these things because that is who we are. Indeed. And it is the women who will assimilate the development of this country. Mm -hmm. So it, political will must also be brought to bear mm -hmm. to ensure that any woman who is interested, there is a support mechanism. And mm -hmm. like uh, there was a lady, Akwetia, she was mm -hmm. a hairdresser and all the mockery. People must stop that. If you have a hairdresser who is able to win an election, that is a serious plus for her. Instead of mocking her, let us support her and build her capacity. Mm. We must build the economic capacity, helping them with access to land, uh, loans, and what have you, to be able to be economically independent. Women must have a fraternity, a sisterhood. Women are 51% plus. So if most women voted for women, we should have more women in parliament. Indeed. And we should have confidence in them. And the name calling, hey... You rub it on your skin, eh? And look good, eh? And just understand that this is my time. And I have decided that I am not here as a passenger. I'm not going to be passive. I'm not going to be a spectator. I'm going to be a citizen. And it comes with a lot of uh, flack mm -hmm. and distractions. Put or ignore them. I had my hairstyle be swagger mama, and they were all <laughs> about it. And why is your hair like this? I can paint my hair green. Does it affect the cost of kinky? Not at all. Uh -huh. mm. So be confident in your skin. And don't worry that somebody's hair is longer than yours or somebody is better. You are the best thing that ever happened to this Ghana as a woman. Enjoy your femininity and push. Let us not be afraid. Sometimes women are afraid to say, speak their mind or they are afraid to be criticized. If you can get pregnant and carry this baby for nine months like Alfred sitting <laughs> here and bring that baby out and school that baby oh my goodness. Eh, to become president, to <laughs> yes. become doctor, 
Why can't you? I have people who say, hey, can a woman be president? Why can't you be a president? You are the president mm -hmm. of your house as a woman. You are the Indeed. president of the community. So, women, I'm saying over to you. Don't sit at the back again. Sit in front. Sit in front and be well prepared for it. The men are not getting it right. This is our time, 2023. Hmm. I wish you women all the power that God has given you. Exhibit it. All the wisdom that you use in bringing up our children. Let's put it together and bring up our Ghana. Let's make sure that there is a sisterhood. If you touch one woman, you touch us all. If one woman is going for an election, let's all go there and support. Let's fight for this country to be how we want to see it. To be the beautiful Ghana, the Ghana of Kalipu, the land of milk and honey. Hmm. That is the Ghana that I believe in. And I'm telling you that it will happen. Indeed. Based on how we treat our women. And if you are not invited to the city, take your own chair. And if there is no chair, better ask an Alfred to get up. Oh my goodness. And you sit there. You want me to lose my job now? Hey, oh, why wow. not? So that the woman can come in. You understand? <laughs> <laughs> don't wait to be invited. Invite yourself. If there's a meeting and they don't call you and you know you should be there, go and let them say that they will not allow you to be there. You understand? Mm, indeed. And be bold and be courageous and be brave. This is Ghana that we are building. And it must be built with women and men side by side, not women behind and men in front. It will never work. Deliberate discrimination. Yes. And this is one term that, that excites me, taking away from this. Madam Otiko Afisa Jabba. Bakope. Thank you. Bakope. Bakope. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for making the time to be here. I want to wish you all the best. I'm grateful. And um, so it, it's, it's done. Politics is done for you. If the people oh. call you to even come and contest for... for I want to mentor Bo other women. Bole, you are not going. Oh, no. Okay. I want okay. to mentor other people to do. And right. there is a time for everything. Right. I've done my bit. Others too must come in and contribute. Everybody must contribute to the Indeed. development of Ghana. It cannot be dependent on only one person. That's right. It's a collective responsibility. And I believe that some will come and go and others will continue to come. And this is the modern woman. She's capable of anything. The sky eh, is just the beginning That's of right. today's woman. I wish you well. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Madam welcome. Otiko Afisa Jabba served two times as the National Women's Organizer of the ruling NPP mm -hmm. and then also former Gender Children and Social Protection Minister. She's done many other things to help contribute to the development of this country. Well, deliberate discrimination. That's food for thought. Thank you so much for staying with us here on Ghana Tonight. On behalf of the rest of the team, as always, we appreciate your company. Do have a good night. I am Alfred Okansi.